today on the call is we have returning Olympic champion Helen Rulis. We have five-time world champion Adeline Gray, 2019 world champions Jakar Winchester and Samira Mensa Stock, 2018 world silver medalist Sarah Hildebrandt, and 2019 U23 world silver medalist Kayla Miracle. So we will, what we're doing here is we're just kind of passing the computer around um, as we get questions for each athlete. So we'll go ahead and get started. Our first one is Chris Cooley. I, I don't know how to say your last name. Sorry, Chris, but <laughs> question That's for okay. It's Cootie Alice. Right. Hi, Sarah. Hi. 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 There you are. From the uh, South Bend Tribune, first of all, congratulations on your accomplishment. I was just curious how the uh, start to your Olympic journey, I guess, in Tokyo has been so far um, with all the COVID restrictions in place. Um, have the, Just curious, like, what kind of measures you guys are having to take that might be different from usual compared to your previous experience at the World Championships and Pan Am Games? Hey, um, we're testing every day, so that's obviously something that's different. So we start the morning um, just going down, getting tested, and filling out symptom surveys. Um, but for the most part, I feel like I'm in my element, normal, just training, and then going back to the hotel, recovering. And that's kind of what I, how I like to train anyway, so it doesn't feel different in that aspect. Um, so yeah, it's good. We have like amazing accommodations. Um, sorry. And uh, we have amazing accommodations. I just... You know, the city has been so welcoming and so hospitable. So uh, feeling super grateful in that aspect. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to Zach Allen, who has a question for Helen Marulis. Hi, Helen. My name's Zach. Uh, I'm from the Daily Collegian. Um, my question is, uh, how much do these Olympics mean to you, given the possible impact that these games can have on the growth of women's wrestling? Yeah, um, well, first of all, I really like your hat. <laughs> and, uh, um, but yeah, no, the Olympic Games has been huge, and especially for the sport of women's wrestling. Uh, women's wrestling debuted in 2004, and if you just look at the, um, the what is it, the numbers and growth for women in the sport, it's just grown tremendously. So, and in the 20 years that I've been in the sport, uh, it's just jump leaps and bounds. So, uh, especially with the team that we have and the amount of medals, I think that we're going to bring home. I think this is going to be really big for uh, America women's wrestling and hopefully globally as well. Thank you. Thanks guys. And as I said, if you have a question, go ahead and put it in the chat for who you have a question for. So we'll move on to Jason Knapp who also would like to talk with Helen. Hey, Helen, good to see you. Hey, uh, I know you've gone through so much you've talked about in this Olympic cycle, but the knee thing going into trial certainly was an added wrinkle. How are you feeling coming after that and going to Poland? Was that just kind of getting the kinks out? I know that didn't go the way you wanted, but do you still feel confident coming off that to, to get where you want to be? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, I think, you know, I guess one of the things I feel very blessed is that I've, I've been down this journey before. And so I just know that uh, sometimes it might not always look like it's going the way you want, but that doesn't mean that that's what the results are going to be. And so um, injuring my knee, coming back, I went to Poland knowing that I wasn't 100%, but just being willing to put myself out there because I wanted to uh, see where I stood and what I need to work on. And honestly, that tournament showed me so much and it's helped me make so many adjustments. And so I have so much confidence going into these games, really because I went there and I challenged myself against the best in the world. So and then health-wise, you know, now my knee's great, and I, I'm just really happy to be here. Thank you. Thanks. We'll move on to Matt Kusla, who has a question for Adeline. Hello. Hello. Um, we, we talked a couple months ago about all the challenges you face in getting here. What's your mindset now that you're this close, and, and uh, you know, like everybody else, when the head of the Tokyo organizing committee said in the last couple of days, well, you know, I, I think we're going to have the Olympics, but wouldn't rule out canceling them at this moment. How, how do you react to that? And how do you stay focused, I guess? Uh, you know, I think it's pretty easy to stay focused at this point. We have a great team here and uh, we're just have a plan and we're executing it. So I think from a mindset standpoint, it's nice to be around other athletes who are in very similar situations to myself where they're gearing up for the biggest tournament of their lives. And it's a, um, great to be in Nakasago City and 
be able to be in an environment where we can just focus and train. So I don't know if we've really had too many outside distractions. Our coaches are doing a pretty good job keeping us kind of sheltered and ready and prepared. Thanks, Matt. We'll go to Les Carpenter and we'll direct him to Kayla Merrill. Hello. Hey. Hello. Hey, uh, Les Carpenter at the Washington Post. Um, some of the men had talked about the welcome that they got from this town. And I don't know, did you kind of see the same thing? Has, has this been, how has this been for you guys? They, they were talking about all the kids coming out to the streets and things. Yeah, so we've all kind of been a unit. Uh, we're staying at the same hotel, training at the same time, riding the same buses, things like that. So seeing the whole entire town, like lining the streets and waving American flags and just like cheering for us, wishing us good luck, um, even the media day that we had yesterday, um, nothing but love um, from their media. You know, we saw it on the news um, and it was just very welcoming and nice to have that love from all the way around the world. Right, we'll go to Zach Allen, who has a follow-up question for Helen. All right, not gonna lie, I had the same question as Les. Um, how has your welcome been in Japan so far? Oh, oh my gosh, it's uh, been incredible. I, uh, well, I know Alan and I have experienced this before, but there is such a thing as the Olympic spirit and it's just, it's so beautiful and it's, it's, such a, it's such a surreal thing to get to experience. And so to come out here into the host country and into Nakatsugawa and to just see the streets like lined with people, little kids, um, elderly and everyone's just waving people writing signs in English, you know, so that we can understand. I mean, it's really amazing. And I think it just reminds you of what the Olympics is all about. And it's just about the world coming together um, and coming together for, for greatness. And that, that means yeah. different things, different people. So. Great. Thanks. Zach. We'll go to Chris Cleales who has a question for Kayla Sarah. <laughs> Sarah, with, uh, you know, obviously you're used to uh, training in your family. Um, oh, no. uh, that's okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay. You know, obviously used to uh, not being around family there in Indiana, but, uh, you know, big international competition was just curious, you know, does not having family and friends around this time is that uh, make a big difference to you um, and just uh, how you're communicating with folks back home? Are you trying to, you know, talk every day? Do you have time for that? Um, just curious on that, that standpoint for you. Yeah. Um, you know, I was obviously like, when you think of this moment, you expect your family to be around. Um, with that said, I've competed internationally without my family around for many years now. Um, and I also just think, you know, with everything it's we've been through to get to this point, to me, I'm like, just giving my chance to step on the mat, you know, anything else would be an extra bonus. So I, it just doesn't seem, I don't feel drawn one way or another with fans there, with my family not here, anything like that. I'm just really kind of zeroed in on stepping on the mat, taking care of business, you know, and, and anything else that comes with that is just like a little extra along the way. But um, I am talking to my family daily. They are incredible. Um, the time difference is big enough that we are, have some good overlap time where I can call from home and, and check in with everybody. So they're super supportive in that aspect and uh, we're on the phone a lot. Awesome. And sorry, just a quick follow up. Um, I know, sorry for not being, you know, exactly in touch of where you guys are all staying, but you're, you're away from Tokyo, right? So you won't be uh, participating in the opening ceremonies. Correct. Yeah, we're in no Nakasagawa, which is what, maybe a few hours outside of Tokyo. Um, so we'll be here until at least myself until the 31st, and then we'll go into Tokyo. Um, I don't compete till the 6th, so about a week before. Um, but opening ceremonies obviously will have already happened. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll go over to Tamara Mensa Stock. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit about the uh, the camaraderie of the of the women's team heading over. Both, I mean, going into trials, I think it was pretty pretty awesome. A lot of you guys were outspoken. I think it just uh, showed even more at trials. Can you speak a little bit about the camaraderie of the team? I'm just here so I don't get fined. 
<laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You guys are all media. You know what I'm quoting. <laughs> but um, the camaraderie is great. Like, look at this. We're laughing. We're having fun. Like, I, I love it. No matter where we're at, we, we, we're, we're a team. We're a close-knit team. And I love it. I love that we can laugh and have fun and get what we need to get done. It's great. Like, we're champions inside and out. And yeah, it's great. <laughs> All right, we'll move on quickly. <laughs> back, Alan. We have a follow up for Alan <laughs> Wait, can, can, can I just say one thing that Tamir Mensa also brought team playing video games and a karaoke machine? So um, she's all about all about the team camaraderie. <laughs> that was hilarious. I I got a kick out of that. But my question for you is: uh, you won gold in Rio but you recently joined the uh, NLWC. Uh, how has the preparation for the Olympics this time around been different since joining that, especially like with the injuries and everything? Yeah, I mean, well, you know the saying, you can't step in the same river twice. So <laughs> this, uh, this quad has definitely been completely 100% different. Um, last quad, I felt like I had the whole four years to zone in and this one, um, I was still focused. It just probably, didn't, it maybe didn't look like that from the outside because I had a lot of injuries and I had a lot of things to face. But I think that um, taking care of your health, taking care of your body, taking care of yourself as a person, that will translate on the mat. And um, so it really just kind of allowed me to be the best version of myself and to have to learn to train in different ways and to listen to my body and really to just grow. So um, I'm very thankful for that. A quick follow-up. Uh, how confident are you going into these games? Very confident. I'm very confident. So it's good. I'm excited. All right, let's stay on Ellen for a second. Um, Andy Hamilton has a question, and then Chris will go to you next for the car Winchester. Hey, Helen. Uh, obviously, obviously, it's easier to move forward with, with success, but but when you go in knowing you're not at, at full strength in an event like like Poland and, and it's your last tune-up for the Olympic Games, you have no other choice but but to turn the page. But how, how are you able to do that mentally to, to get into a good spot, you know, a month, month and a half later? Yeah, so my wrestling and my faith are very intertwined, and I just really will kind of trust my intuition and I'll trust guidance, and I really felt like um, – you know, I, I felt like the hardest ask of myself was to go to Poland knowing where I was at and knowing that, like, you might show the world this this not a great version of yourself or your wrestling, but this is necessary to be prepared for where you need to be in Tokyo. And uh, I believe that I'll always, I'll always do, you know, whatever it is, whatever I need to ask of myself, I'll, I'll do it and I'll come through. So Poland was necessary. I'm so thankful that I went because a lot of stuff just got out there and it really helped me to kind of tap back into some things that I remembered about how I used to compete on the international stage because really my last full international tournament was in 2017 at the world championships so it's been a very very long time so it was really nice to go to Poland and just be reminded like oh yeah this is what it's like in the cafeteria and around fun competition and on the bus so you know it helped a lot thanks Andy we'll move on to the next question Hi, uh, I was, Jakar, I wanted to ask you about, um, it sounded like uh, one of your teammates talked about um, somebody brought like a karaoke machine or oh, video games or something. I was just curious how you guys spend your free time together, kind of building on that question, you know, with all the uh, restrictions in place, you know, obviously you're training, you're, you're trying to stay on top of nutrition, resting, everything. I was curious, Joe, when you have fun moments together, what kind of stuff do you guys get to do? Um, so a lot of people like to do their own thing, you know, like Tamara likes to sing karaoke. Um, I like to play video games. I actually hate karaoke, but I came down because I heard Tamara singing by herself <laughs> for like 20 minutes. So when you see somebody singing by themselves and I just couldn't leave her hanging. So stuff, I think stuff like that makes it fun, you know, joining in, even though you're very uncomfortable doing it, but you end up having fun anyway. Um, and I think that's what builds the team. Thanks a lot. Guys, we'll go back to CJ Matita and NBC or question for Adeline. Adeline, I know there, there's no formal, unlike gymnastics, there's no formal team competition beyond the inner in individual, but 
Um, can you speak a little bit about just the, the USA mentality versus uh, the Japan women? I mean, the Japanese women, I've just had such a stronghold within the women's wrestling program um, as a at world championships at Olympics. They've just taken home so many top placing medals that it's someone we're chasing consistently and they've provided such an excellence. And I think it just has been a program that we've been able to watch and inspire to be. And they invested early and their country and the people behind them um, jumped on board and were willing to appreciate these women for their excellence. And I think it's really shown what that investment can look like. And I think our program is catching up to that. I think our program has had the investment and it's had the talent. And now we're in a position where these women are ready to step on a field in home soil with Japan. And I think we're going to be able to contest with them. And so it's pretty exciting to be able to know that we were on a, a good a good pace on to, to be able to reach Japan and just looking forward to my team having a great performance because I really do believe we have the talent to be able to rival this group of, of Japanese women. Are you happy to kind of be out there first, set the stage? Uh, yeah, you know, I never get to compete first. So it's been something new and exciting to kind of uh, get the wheels turning and uh, make sure that we have a good good foundation headed into the rest of the games. But either way, I think I have a lot of faith in each one of these women to step on the mat and do their job. And when it comes down to it, this is an individual sport. And the only way we walk away with a team title and to feel good about how the team uh, can overcome a country as great as Japan is, is by each of us doing our jobs individually. Andy Hamilton has a question for Adeline. Hey Adeline. Uh, you've obviously competed in Japan quite a bit and in front of the fans there and women's wrestling, tremendously popular there. Your, your reaction to the announcement that there weren't going to be any fans and in the stands and, and what do you think it'll be like complete, competing in a spectatorless arena? I was looking forward to the energy that was going to be in the room. I mean, obviously, when we found out our families weren't going to be there and no foreign spectators, that was a disappointment. But even just the energy of the Japanese fans is going to be just exhilarating and motivating. It's uh, they're, They really do, like Helen brought up, the Olympic spirit kind of runs deep within this respectful country. And, and the fans, I think, really bring some of that energy to cheering for the underdog and not just cheering for the Japanese athletes. Um, Obviously, there is a poll for Japanese athletes in a Japanese country. So um, that I was a, a little nervous just for that energy. You can ride that energy. I've, I've won a world championship on home soil. And so having that experience, um, I know it brings an edge. And so the fact that they're, they're not going to have that edge now, I think is just a little bit more favor for Team USA. Um, but when it comes down to it, we still get to have the world have an experience and, and of our hard work and effort of wrestling. And so I'm looking forward to people still getting to watch on TV, still having primetime spots of us getting uh, to have our finals matches seen by the entire world. And I'm just looking forward to kind of that exposure and, and people still to get to cheer on women's wrestling um, and kind of further that growth. Thank you. Let's go back to Chris, who has a question for <laughs> Hi, Samir. Kind of following up on that last question from Andy, um, was curious, just the lack of uh, spectators. I mean, is that something you're preparing for mentally? Um, do you, how do you feel it'll impact the environment when you're out there honestly, performing? Honestly, it, it, it doesn't phase me at all. So anytime we really go overseas, there's not a lot of fans really in the stands ever. It's mostly just the athletes that, from what I can remember. So now it's basically gonna be the exact same thing. So I'm like, oh, this is gonna be great. Like there's not gonna be a lot of cheering. And typically when I'm cheering for my teammates, you only hear like five or six people. So yeah, it's, it's not gonna fade me a bit. It's gonna be fine. Thanks. Good question? All right. <laughs> 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 Let's pass the thank you. Around all of them. What does that what does their leadership and their experience help you going into so me being the baby of the baby. group, basically? Yeah. I mean, I think women's wrestling, Helen mentioned it, like or I think it was one thing too, talking about Japan elevating. Um, the sport and then with 
the team that we've built now, like the sport has just been elevated for us women. So I've followed, like I've been beat by Helen for a world team and I've been beat, you know, my only college loss was to Sarah, you know, Jakar and I have battled, like we've all been in a bracket at some point. I think four of us, the four lightest weights were in a world team bracket. You know, that's great. So, <laughs> so we're just like, they've elevated the game so much. So I want to be part of that legacy. So I'm not going to sit back. Like it's not just going to happen. I have to follow suit and elevate my game as well. So just really good examples. Pass it over to Jakar. Jakar, I think last year, um, the two years, whatever, you've made a weight change. You've also had so much time in between. Um, this, this game, what's the journey been like for you? And what have been some of your, your highest points and your biggest challenges that you've had to overcome? Um, I think just sticking to um, a lifestyle that is like changing everything, how can you get better? Like uh, being a perfectionist is kind of hard, trying to do that and kind of say like, you win a world championship and you're like, okay, I'm the best in the world. Now, how can I be better than that? You know, like just, okay, what can I do better? Because you can always learn from something. And I think that just put it in the hard work and even like, am I working hard enough? Am I doing what I need to do? Because there's not always, there's always a point where you question like, am I doing too much? Am I overworking? And then I don't want to not put in that work because I don't want to regret not doing that. So just finding the fine line of what you need to do and how you need to do it, how you need to go about it, and trusting the process and knowing that no matter what, I've done what I needed to do and I can do it again. You know, it's not something impossible to do. Cool. Uh, pass it over to Sarah. We've got a question from Chris. Hi, Sarah. Um, do you, you had the uh, simulation a couple of weeks ago in, in Indiana where you came out on top, was just curious, you know, with the results of that, do you kind of feel like you're the woman to beat in your event? Is there any extra pressure associated with that? Or was that mostly just a confidence boost? Yeah, I mean, just that was domestically. So going into this, it, it definitely, you know, gives me some confidence just in terms of um, it's a good way to gauge where I'm at, you know, the things I'm working on in practice, they're translating into the matches. Um, so to be able to see that and have that actual competition feel before going in, um, definitely all positives from that. Uh, I think we did a really good job of just simulating how the Olympics will actually be. Um, and, and just in terms of those nerves and navigating how that feels, uh, every time I get an opportunity to experience that and, and practice that is, is definitely one that I'm gonna take advantage of. Awesome. I have a, a quick follow-up question kind of um, on the topic of like journeys uh, that Taylor's been asking some of your teammates, just your journey. Uh, you started off at King University in small Bristol, uh, Tennessee. We're just curious, like when you were, you know, on the mats there in, in Bristol, did you envision something like this happening one day? Was this always part of your plan? Or when did you realize like this Olympic dream uh, could really come true? Yeah, so when I was at King, I definitely had the aspirations, um, you know, to become an Olympian and go to the Olympics. Uh, and I think that was a really special thing about that room was we weren't, all the women in that room were not just training to become collegiate national champions, although that was, you know, a goal of ours. But uh, really, all of the women in that room wanted to do big things on the senior level. And, and the Olympics was definitely a goal of so many people in there. And, um, you know, my, team, my former teammate, and she's a Olympian as well, Haley Algallo. So we both came out of that program at the same time. Um, it just speaks to the mindset of everyone in that room. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like even when I was a little kid, I dreamt about the Olympics. And um, it was kind of just something I always, you know, I had a big dream and goal was chasing that. Um, but I would say it did not become very real until about 2017, 2018. Um, after I had dislocated my elbow, I really kind of rededicated myself to the sport um, and decided, you know, this is 
to be honest with myself and reflect what it's going to take to actually commit to this instead of just it being a dream, you know, in the distance. Um, really, relatively recently as to when I decided to commit to this. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. If there's no more questions for the athletes, we'll excuse them and make Terry Steiner our Olympic. All right, we'll start off with Coach Steiner now. Coach, um, just talk about the talent of this team. Obviously, Japan's been one to beat, and it looks like with this roster, we have that capability. Can you just expand on that? Yeah, I mean, we definitely have a team that, that has a lot of uh, ability, a lot of uh, um, awareness of who they are, I guess, and, and they've been here before, right? I mean, they've all been on the, on the big state, right? Well, and maybe not, maybe not the Olympic Games, but the World Championships, and, and we've had a lot of success here with this group, and, and so I, I think they're feeding up each other, um, and you know, what, what I like about if I look back from the Olympic trials moving forward, our preparation, our camps, uh, how they've gone about their daily business has been very professional and they, they seem very uh, uh, targeted at, in their approach. And so uh, I see no reason why we can step forward and, and challenge Japan. I mean, Japan is not the only team here, right? There are other top teams. There's you know, Russia's coming in, China's coming in, the, the, the Ukraine's coming in. I mean, they're, they're all tough teams in the sport of women's wrestling. Um, but when I look at the team that we have and the personalities and the talent on this team, um, there's nobody that stands above us. You know, we have to go out and prove ourselves. We have to go out and compete. Um, but, um, if we have the performance that we're capable of, uh, we can stand with it. Coach, can you talk about the preparation at this camp in Pasadena and what that looks like for you guys, kind of the daily schedule, that kind of thing? Well, I mean, we've, you know, we've worked hard with, with uh, our performance team, uh, with the USOPC and, and our, our staff and our personal coaches. Um, so uh, basically this, this camp is about um, 12 days long for some, or nine days long for the others. So, we're basically in a, in a three day rotation, a three day cycle. So the first day coming in uh, was just kind of getting ourselves feeling good. But then on day two, um, again, and if you look at the science of it and the, the numbers that the athletes have given on day two, five, and eight should be the days that they're feeling the best. Um, and so those days that we made, we made our hard training days. And then the days that follow, um, our individual days, day three, day three, day six, and then day um, nine are our kind of um, individual days, a little bit less intense. And then we have a recovery day after that. So we have a hard day, uh, we have an individual day, and then we have a recovery day. And that's kind of how we're going about it. Uh, the first group that goes into Tokyo, uh, the bigger weights, the miracle, Tamara Mensa stock, and we will go through three of those cycles, and in the lighter weights, we'll go through four of those cycles. Um, but really, at this point in time, you, you give to the individual needs of the athlete. So if they are, they're really feeling something different, and how their body's reacting to the trip and you're trying to get rid of the jet lag, um, you give to those needs at this point in time. Right? Um, we're, we're just all working together and making sure we're communicating. And what each of these athletes really need to, to perform at the highest level. Okay, Mark Kiesler, go ahead with your question for Coach Steiner. Coach Steiner, Mark Kiesler, Denver Post. Um, there's been a lot of debate around the world about whether these games should even take place, but what does this opportunity mean to these women athletes on your team? Uh, especially given that they've waited so long for this opportunity, you know, and changed their lives and, 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 and sacrifice so much for it. Well, I, I think at this point in their lives, it's it's maybe one of the most important events they ever had right, for a lot of them. And, and so it is important. But it's not everything, but it's important, right? They, they put years of their life away, um, you know, in in chase of this this you know dream and this this accomplishment. So to not have it would, would be devastating. There's no doubt about it. 
you know, it's going to feel different, right? Like, like the athletes have talked about, it's going to feel different. It's going to look different. But the, the thing that we've talked about a little bit is that, that you know, the honor is the same and the middle around your neck is going to feel the same as well. And, and so, um, you know, whether there's people in the stands or not in the stands, um, you know, I don't think that is really the most important. People will still be watching and, and the rest of the world will be watching. They know what's at stake. Um, they know the preparation that they put in, and so um, it's an important event, and, and you know, they're here to, you know, perform well. Success, you know, comes down to performance, and and can can they perform at the time they need to, right? And, and that's where we're at. Andy Hamilton, go ahead. Hey, Terry. Yeah. Uh, Obviously, the, the heavy lifting is already done in terms of the training, but, but the last like week and a half, what, what do you do to keep them busy, keep them sharp without uh, having so much idle time on their hands that uh, they burn up mental energy at this point? Well, like, like you've seen in, in the interviews with the athletes, I mean, they're, they're a pretty tight group, right? And they, they get along very well, and the training partners are also here, and the personal coaches are also here. So, you know, everyone's in on that and, and what their needs are on a daily basis. I mean, we're limited a little bit on what we can do or it's not like we're walking around town. We don't have much time outside of the hotel or outside of the training venue. Um, we have like an hour and a half in the morning and an hour and a half, hour and a half in the evening that we can be literally outside on a path and walking around and things like that. Other than that, we're inside. But that's, that's the same for everyone, right? That's, it's no different for Team Russia or Team Japan or anyone else. I mean, the same situation here. And, and we understand that. And it was very professional about it. And they understand the limitations. But ultimately, um, you know, during this time frame, that they're just doing what they need to feel good and, and prepare for a competition. So we're in a location in the Katsugawa, Japan, that is a a very um, rural community, I would say, and where, where the hotel we're at is tucked away into the mountains. And I mean, it's beautiful, it's quiet, it's pleasant, I mean, it's peaceful. And it's a perfect place for them to just ease their minds and, and get prepared for battle. Right? And that's what we're doing. Lee Scheiderman has a question for Terry. Go ahead, Lee. Hey, Terry. Uh, my question is, uh, this is your fifth, uh, fifth team, your fifth Olympic team you're coaching. Uh, what makes this group special or stands out from the other uh, teams that you've coached? Well, I think just the, the, the leadership on the team, number one, I think that, you know, there's, there's veteran leaders throughout the team. I mean, they're, they, they, they've been on this stage before and, and they know what to expect and, and they know how to win and they know how to prepare. Right. And so I think that, you know, to have, to have a full team like that, you know, before we've had certain team members that maybe were, had this kind of leadership and, and just knowledge of what this um, is all about. And now we have a full team, you know, and I feel very comfortable. I feel, feel very confident with the group we have that they can stand up with anyone out there. And, um, yeah, I feel a lot like I do when we went into the Pan Am qualifier. I felt very confident that we were going to get all ways qualified when we walked into the Pan Am Olympic Games qualifier. And I would say I feel very confident right now that uh, we, can, we can go in there and, and bring home what we want to bring home. So um, you know, I'm, I'm excited about the team. And really, that comes from just how they've gone about the business right? and how they're dealing with the team and everything. I love our preparation, how it's been, and it doesn't always translate to success on the competition mat, but it's a good indicator for sure. And, and I think that um, how focused in there, you know, I think the, the personal coaches and the training partners have done an unbelievable job of, of preparing um, to get these athletes ready. Uh, there's really a team around each athlete, a personal coach, a training partner, and then, you know, staff coaches kind of float, you know, throughout all of them. But, you know, that, that personal coach and the training partner really, they know, they know what we're up against. They, they know our competition. They, they put them through the drills and, and, uh, and uh, 
things that they need to do to, to be prepared and, and have the knowledge of when we step out on the Olympic mat. So I feel very good about um, you know how the, the personal coaches and the training partners have taken taking their job seriously and then preparing these athletes and, and really you know I feel with this team that they know what they're doing they know how to win and some part of me is like you, you just don't want to overcoach right you kind of just want to stay out of their way and then let them do what they're doing and just give them guidance and direction where it's needed but not over things we'll take our final question from Chris Gudialis for Dr. Chris Hi, Terry. Um, I'm writing a story on uh, Sarah Hildebrandt. You mentioned that, uh, you know, a lot of the, your athletes have teams and personal coaches around them. I was just curious to what extent you've been able to work with uh, Sarah here in Tokyo and kind of what qualities you like about her as a wrestler and, um, you know, just as she prepares here for her first time in the Olympics. Um, is there, do you find yourself working any more or less with her than you would your you know, your Helens, for example, that have kind of been there, done that? No, I think, you know, I think personally for myself, I just kind of float around and then help each individual as, as I see fit. But I think, again, I think the personal coaches have done a great job uh, of taking their, job, their role seriously. And we've got meetings in our, in our first camp. About, you know, we sat down with each Olympian and each personal coach and training partner and it kept, gave them our expectations of what their roles and responsibilities were. Throughout the summer, we gave them uh, a um, hard drive with you know all of their opponents' information over the last four to six years, all of their matches. So so there's no stone left unturned, right? and and it's really us just keeping in contact. Both Chris and and myself keeping in contact with the personal coaches and making sure we're all working united and in the same direction and, and making sure the athletes are getting a clear message and we're not spinning their heads and, and giving them different information. And, and so um, you know, I think that, that again, the team behind the team has done a great job of, of preparing and coming to the athlete with, with the right information and the right purpose. And, and so, Sarah, Sarah comes to the, you know, I mean, she comes forward with everything, right? You can, you can um, do a lot of guiding and directing and, and, and coaching, but the athlete is the talent, right? And I think sometimes we forget that. But they're the talent and, and they're the person that, that brings most to the table. And, and I think we just need to make sure that, that they stay in that position where it's our job to empower them. And, and help them along, along that path. Uh, and, and Sarah is a very uh, focused athlete, a very competitive athlete, and you know she's been hungry for what's what's coming in. Right? And, and I think that there, all of the athletes understand the importance of the event. Obviously, we're at the Olympic Games, but I also think they have uh, a very good balance there. And they realize that uh, it's not everything either. Right. And maybe the most important thing right now in their lives, maybe the, the thing that they spend most of their time and energy on, and have spent most of their time and energy on um, uh, over the last four to eight years, probably if not longer. Uh, but you know, it's just a part of their lives. It does, it's not everything to them. And um, I think that's a very healthy outlook um, as they look into a Olympic competition. Thank you. Okay, thank you guys so much for joining us today. Um, we will be uploading this to YouTube as soon as we can, and we'll send out an email to you guys um, with the link. So keep an eye out. Hopefully Wi-Fi works quickly, but thank you guys for joining us. Hopefully we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. Taylor.